so I'm going to talk about this K eigenvalue problem, which is a problem that, sh that shows up in the design and analysis of nuclear reactors. And the reason that we're interested in, in taking on this problem is that if we're able to, to solve these problems in greater detail, if we're able to, to greater resolve the physics, um, then we can reduce levels of, of uncertainties that um, turn out to be limiting factors in operating these reactors. So if we can reduce those uncertainties, um, then we can do things like increasing the power output of existing reactors. We can extend operating lifetimes. Um, these things correspond to, to lower operating costs and ultimately um, lower cost of, of electricity that's provided by the reactors. Um, in addition, uh, we hope to be able to make improvements to, to the next generation of reactors um, and improve um, features like um, creating reactors that are, that are passively safe, which is something that's um, a, a big area of, of research in the industry right now. Um, our governing equation here is a, a Boltzmann equation. So this is the, the Boltzmann neutron transport equation. And what we're solving for is this, um, what we call the angular flux psi. And this quantity is a function of spatial location, um, direction of particle travel, and energy. Um, so we have a, a very large phase space that, that we have to deal with with this problem. Um, in this equation, uh, we've got several, several quantities, all of these sigma, chi, nu, and sigma f. Um, these are exper experimentally determined values. Um, what we're really interested in this problem is finding, uh, so we have this eigenvalue k, which is introduced here um, to enforce a balance in the equation. And we're interested in determining the largest value of k and the corresponding eigenvector psi, such that this equation holds. And it's that largest eigenvalue that has a physical significance that, um, that tells you the level of multiplication of the system that you're studying. Um, so in particular, if that value of k is exactly equal to 1, then we say that we've got a critical system, and the, the population of particles will be stable in time. If k is less than 1, then the system is subcritical, and the, the particle population will decay. And if k is greater than 1, then the, the population will increase in time. Um, we take a, a deterministic a, approach to this problem. So we take our entire phase space, so space, angle, and energy, and we're going to discretize every aspect of, of the, uh, the problem. Um, in particular, what we're going to be looking at in, in this study, um, in energy, we use what's called a, a multi-group approximation. Um, in angle, we use a discrete ordinance, which is a, a collocation method. And we're really indifferent to the spatial discretization that we can use. So there's a, a large variety of different spatial discretizations that have been used. We can do finite difference, finite element, finite volume, characteristics-based methods. Um, virtually anything that you can think of um, can be used for the, the spatial discretization. So we play, play some, some tricks. Uh, this is the, the standard notation that we use to write the problem. Um, we can reduce the size of the problem by, by doing a little manipulation. And really what we end up with is a generalized eigenvalue problem. So we have this AX equals lambda BX is, is ultimately what we're trying to solve. And the matrices that appear here, A and B, are extremely large matrices, and they're dense. Um, and having dense matrices is something that doesn't show up in a lot of fields. A lot of people are used to dealing with smart, sparse matrices. And the density makes it really difficult to deal with. So it means we have absolutely no hope of actually forming these matrices. We, can't, we can never store them. Uh, but because of the structure of this problem, we can do matrix vector products with, the, with these um, operators in reasonably, we can do it reasonably efficiently. Because of the, the large phase space that we have to deal with, uh, transport problems can get very, very large. They're significant multi-scale problems. So here's an example of what nuclear data looks like. So this is essentially an interaction probability as a function of energy. And so we see we have these regions where we have these large resonances. And so the an interaction probability can change by several orders of magnitude within a, a very, very narrow width. Um, so trying to resolve that, that sort of behavior requires very, very fine discretizations. In addition, the, um, the spatial detail of the systems that we're trying to model is, is very complicated. So we've got, um, on the left, a fuel pin, which is something on the order of a centimeter across. This is a small component of a fuel assembly. So there might be several hundred fuel pins per assembly, and there might be several hundred assemblies to, um, that make up an entire reactor core. Um, so there, there's many different um, scales involved. And this, um, the result is that these problems can become very, very large. Um, the standard approach to, to taking on this problem, um, we start with the generalized eigenvalue problem. There aren't very many algorithms that attack a generalized eigenvalue problem directly. So generally what is done, the matrix A is guaranteed to be invertible, and so we convert it into a standard eigenvalue problem and apply the power method um, to this transformed system. 
Um, this poses a difficulty, though. In order to, to multiply by this new operator, A inverse B, we have to effectively invert or in practice solve a linear system with this matrix A. Um, that traditionally would be done with a block gauss seidel iteration, where the block in the block gauss seidel is all of your space angle unknowns. So it's um, sort of an energy-wise block. And so even one, one of these blocks is still a very large problem and not something that can be solved directly. So we end up with, to do one gauss seidel iteration, you have to solve a sequence of monoenergetic transport equations. And then these would typically be solved with, say, a, a fixed point iteration, a Richardson iteration. Um, some, some more recent codes have, have started, started using Krelov methods um, more frequently. Um, and the significant issue is we have this, this nested structure. Any or all levels of this iteration can be very slow to converge. Um, so we can potentially have to apply acceleration schemes or some sort of preconditioner to all three levels of this iteration process. So there can be up to six different iterations going on within a, a single computation in a transport problem. Um, and so a few of you might know Tom Evans at, at Oak Ridge. Um, this is one of his, his favorite phrases for, for um, describing this nested iteration structure. It, it, it's turtles all the way down. And um, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with the phrase, look it up on Wikipedia, and you can uh, see a, a nice little anecdote about the, the origins of this phrase. Um, so when we started, started studying this problem, um, we really looked at it and, and said, it's this nested iter iteration structure that's really killing the efficiency of the solvers. So is there a way that, that we can get out of this regime? Um, and so what we decided is we really need to solve the generalized eigenvalue problem directly. So it's this conversion to a standard eigenvalue problem that is really hindering us. Um, and what we came across was a method called the Davidson method that was proposed in the mid-70s for computational chemistry problems. Um, and it, it, the framework sort of allows you to work directly um, acting on this generalized eigenvalue problem. And the idea behind a Davidson method is you define a preconditioner. And in, at each iteration, we're going to build up a subspace just by applying a preconditioner to the eigenvalue residual. So this is somewhat similar to like an Arnaldi method that people are probably more fam uh, familiar with. Um, the difference is that the Arnaldi method has a very, very structured subspace, whereas the Davidson method is building up a completely unstructured subspace. So we don't have, um, we can't make some of the, the simplifying um, simplifications to the calculations that we do in Arnaldi, um, which makes the, the subspace calculations slightly um, more expensive here, but because our operators are so expensive, it's really a negligible additional cost. Um, to fill the, the role of the preconditioner. So the preconditioner is usually something that in some sense approximates the, um, the action of this matrix A. Um, so we spent a, a very long time developing a preconditioner that, that would work well here. And so we developed a, a, a multi-grid and energy approach. And the, the multi-grid and energy was very novel to the field. So uh, multi-grid methods have been used in, in transport for the, the space and, and even for the angle portion of the phase space, but it's never really been used for, for the energy component. So we spent a long time um, developing this method, identifying smoothers that, that work well for this, um, uh, doing Fourier analysis to, to kind of select some of the parameters that are involved. Um, we wanted to, to get a head-to-head -head comparison of, of some of the, the leading solvers that have been used, something that's, that's happened in the transport community. There have been a lot of new methods that have been implemented, and people tend to always compare them to the, the power method. And so there, there's not a lot of, of comparison among different types of eigen solvers. It's always comparing against to a method which is known to be robust, but really, really slow. So we wanted to provide sort of a, an even comparison between a, a large variety of different um, solvers. And so we use the, the NUT radiation transport code. So this is a code that's maintained at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's a very well-known code, um, has been used for, for a number of years with a lot of success. Um, and we came up with a couple of test problems. So the left test problem is the high temperature test reactor. So this was a, a case that some of the engineers at Oak Ridge National Lab actually gave to me. I, I, I went to them and said, you know, give me a problem that's difficult. What's something that you, you've been having trouble with? And so they came up with this problem. Um, and then another test problem is the C5G7 MOX benchmark. And this is a problem that's been used as a, as a benchmark test for, for transport solvers um, for quite some time. And it's a, a very well-known benchmark and a problem that is known to be extremely difficult. So here's what the, the eigenvector looks like for the HTTR problem for four of the different energy groups. Um, so we see we've got very different physics, different behavior happening um, in the, the various energy groups. So this is why we need, we need to resolve that energy structure. 
Um, here's the same, same thing for the C5G7 problem. So again, very different behavior um, happening in different energy groups. So here is our, our base performance um, for this problem. This is comparing a, a large variety of different cases. So, so the power method here is what you would see in Newt if you just picked it up and used it without, without any modifications. Um, this CMFD is coarse mesh fi finite difference. It's a nonlinear acceleration scheme that is known to be very, very fast, but it also tends to be very unstable. And it, it depends on a um, very careful selection of parameters that if they're not selected just right, um, the method will degrade significantly or even diverge. Um, then these three methods down here, so the Arnaldi method, Rayleigh quotient iteration, and our Davidson method um, were new to the Newt code. Um, I would say the Arnaldi, the Arnaldi method is most similar to what is most commonly done in high-level production codes right now. So uh, that's a, a commonly used method. Um, what was really tremendous for us is that uh, this Davidson method with the multigrid and energy preconditioner that we developed was actually able to beat out the nonlinear acceleration scheme. And this was something that was, was very surprising to a lot of people because people tend to think that the nonlinear schemes are absolutely the best way to go if you can get them to work. But very frequently, they don't work. Um, so what we found is that our method, which is actually quite robust and, and depends on parameters which are highly problem um, independent, um, is actually able to outperform the nonlinear schemes for uh, large classes of problems. Uh, we had um, a number of discussions with some of the, the engineers at Oak Ridge, um, and we had this sort of um, fortunate uh, discussion about some issues that they were having in one of their radiation transport codes. Um, it's a code called De Novo. Um, it's a, a 3D structured mesh transport solver. And so they were, were looking at very large scale problems and trying to scale these problems out to use all of Jaguar, which is about 225,000 cores. Um, and they were hitting sort of a brick wall at about 20,000 cores, and which for some people, being able to scale well out to 20,000 cores is still, still very good, but they wanted to be able to scale all the way out to, to use all of Jaguar. Um, and what they were seeing is that the, the block Gauss-Seidel approach that's um, inherent to, to most um, solvers is inherently sequential in energy. So to do a block Gauss-Seidel, you have to solve the first energy group before you can move on to the second. You've got to solve the second before you move on to the third. And so there's no real parallelism that you can get out of that. But if you recall, the, this Davidson method, everything is cast in terms of matrix vector products. So matrix vector products can be performed completely parallel in energy. So using the Davidson method, what this allows us to do is to not only parallelize the problem in space, but we can also decompose it in energy. So, so we can decompose it in a problem into maybe 20,000 spatial domains and then 10 sets of energy groups. And so we can, we can actually get out to, to 200,000 cores. And so this is still a work in progress. So, so they've done something similar with their Arnaldi solver, which allows them to do um, something close to this. But they still are still seeing significant um, degradation at about 100,000 cores. So our, our current work is implementing um, this Davidson solver in there. And so we're really hoping in the near future that we'll be able to, um, to demonstrate this um, scalability out to, to using all of Jaguar. Um, so I want to acknowledge a few people. So my practicum, practicum advisor, Jim Warsa at Los Alamos, is a, a very good experience for me. Um, some of my mentors, Kevin Clarno and Tom Evans at, uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab who I'm fortunate to, to now have as um, colleagues at the lab. Uh, my advisor, McKelly Binzi, was uh, wonderful to work with. I, I can't even describe how much I learned working with him. Um, all of my fellow CSGFers, um, it's been wonderful getting to know you over the past four years, and I hope we continue to be able to work together in the future. And then everyone at, at DOE and Corel, um, I'm truly grateful for, for the experience that I've had.